It's with much great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Cal Morton. Uh, Dr. Morton received his PhD from Bath University. He's also held postdoctorate positions at Bristol and Oxford University and at Buck Institute for Re Research into Aging. Um, Dr. Morton's interest is in mitochondria health and disease. And to those who are familiar with MECFS and long COVID, you know, as you know, mitochondria is quite a big thing. It's the energy house of our cells, and it's found to be quite depleted in both these illnesses, as I understand. I'm Dr. Morton. His research interest also covers um, energy metabolism as a therapeutic strategy in cancer, um, fatigue associated blood factors in MECFS, which we'll be talking about today, and Raman spectroscopy as a tool for energy metabolism, which you'll also be talking about. Um, Today, uh, Dr. Morton is a pr principal investigator and director of graduate studies in Nuffield Department of Women's and Reproductive Health at the University of Oxford, so quite a good university. And Dr. Morton's talk today titled Understanding the Underlying Biology Behind MECFS. Um, it'll include his research into identifying fatigue associated blood factors in MECFS, as well as developing a blood uh, cell based diagnostic tool for this illness. So it's with great pleasure, I conclude um, the first part of the presentation and hand over to Dr. Morden. So a bit about me. So I'm, I live in the UK, obviously, you know, I, I work at the University of Oxford. Um, so I'm, I'm actually transmitted this from a small town called Whitney, which some of you might know, it's sort of west of Oxford, uh, near near um, Woodstock, which is where they have Blenheim Palace. Um, so yeah, um, and when I told my wife I was going to give a talk in New Zealand, she got rather excited because obviously we were there five years ago. And when I said it was on Zoom, that excitement sort of materialized. It disappeared quite quickly. So, so we will come back at some point. So maybe next time I can give this talk in person. So I've I've worked at the university for for over thirty years. Um, so my background is in mitochondria, which you can see on the on the right hand side of the slides. Just put my pointer on so you can see. Uh, laser over here. Um, let's see if that work. Let's try again. Yeah. So on, on here, so we stain we stain the mitochondria in these cells in green and red. And I've worked on mitochondria for for thirty years in different areas. I started off in the sort of rare mitochondrial diseases, which are which are becoming more more common because we can pick them up better. Um, and then worked on different aspects of mitochondria. So we're based at the uh, John Radcliffe Hospital, which is outside of the main city. So this is the sort of fancy old university buildings look really grand. And then we live in, we're based in this 1970s building, which is pretty much falling down. Uh, so we're in the middle floor and we have the whole floor. So I work in the women's reproductive health department. Um, so my link to that department is historical, really. I came in, in there with my sort of PI at the time. But now we're very interested in diseases that affect women. So many, many conditions like MECFS, MS, uh, fibromyalgia, long COVID, they seem to be more common in women than, than anybody else. So, so there's a big interest within the department, a growing department to sort of study that. So, so I'm going to tell you a bit about my work in MECFS, but I thought I'd just introduce my, my lab to start with. I'm just going to try and remove this. Uh, that's out of the way. So, so this is the guys that do the work. Um, so Tiffany was my a PhD student many years ago. Then she became a postdoc in my lab, and she actually took over over my old job, which, which I used to run the lab. She's now the lab manager, and it's really great to have her within the department. So she supports sort of the, the research work when I don't have the time. Jamie Strong is actually a patient. I met Jamie six years ago at, a, at an ME meeting. Well, I met his mom, actually. So he, I, I talked, I gave a talk just like this to the Amiga meeting, which is the Oxford group for, for action. And Jamie's mom came up and said to me afterwards, Jamie's really interested in the science, but he couldn't make it today. You know, could he come and have a chat? And he came and had a chat um, and we got on really well. And then he came to work with us a few days a week. Um, part time and now is actually doing a medical statistics course at Oxford University so he's quite incredible he's not working with us officially but he's still helping us with a lot of our data stuff and I'll talk about that Janet is uh, supposed to be retired uh, Janet always keeps telling me that she shouldn't be coming to work she should be retired and then also then tells me that she was up at 12 o'clock reading papers so I don't think Janet's quite ready yet Janet is brilliant at doing imaging of tissues and I'll show you some of her work um, Fran is a new person in the group. So Fran has just started working on Lyme disease. So we're trying to look for pathogens. Uh, I'll mention that quite a lot through my talk. This is a really interesting, important area, I think, in not just Lyme disease, but also in chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, CFS, and long COVID. 
Uh, Angel's a sort of a lab, lab person working with us on delivery of materials. And down the bottom, we have uh, this sort of D, DPhil and PhD students. My, my research is really run by these people. We don't have the money to bring in sort of experienced researchers at the moment. So they do a great job. So Megan works on the cancer work. And then we have Edie and Inga who are doing some quite really quite difficult projects in ME CFS, uh, and, and they're sort of getting through that. And over here um, is Katie and Holly, who are doing some basic biology, which I'll just mention before we get into the main guts of the talk, because I'm, I'm a basic scientist. So I get excited by the uh, by the biology, the science behind mitochondria and, and, and that side of things. I thought I'd just take two slides just to tell you some exciting results we've got, and we can perhaps pick on up on these at the end, because I think these results could be really important in this illness. Now, it's very early days, but we're getting some really quite exciting data. So I'm going to talk about that just briefly, and then I'll come back to the chronic fatigue uh, MECFS work. And so um, in terms of evolutionary terms, um, so this is how, it, how we believe it happened. Um, I'm just going to get rid of some of these. I've got lots of bars all over my screen. They're getting in the way, so uh, that's fine. So, so mitochondria, we believe, were once a bacteria, an archaeobacteria, um, which took up um, these bacteria and then produced what we now think are think of as mitochondria. So these are these sort of structures over on the right-hand side. So complicated molecules inside all of our cells. You have a like an outer casing, and then inside you have these invaginated membranes, lots packed inside. And within those membrane brains are the bits that make the energy of our systems. And all of our cells have these. And so we've evolved into these animal cells here. So you have the mitochondria. And uh, what I'm gonna suggest to you that this isn't the end, that we've actually carried on evolving. And this is quite, some people, when I talk about this, say that this is heresy and this isn't true. You can't say that, but we've got really good evidence now that this is not the end and we've evolved in some of our tissues into structures that can make energy, but they don't involve mitochondria like this, but they do involve the proteins that are inside this structure. And the other area I wanna talk about a little bit is so part what way along this process and probably millions of years ago, um, these cells took up a, a cyanobacteria and these are the things we get in the ocean, the blue green algae that are really common uh, and really good at fixing carbon. They're quite an important organism. And they were taken up by a cell and that, became eventually a chloroplast. And these are the things in plants. So these are the things that fix, uh, take a sunlight and fix carbon uh, and produce energy. So you can make energy in something like a chloroplast just as well as you can in a mitochondria. And I just want to mention these. So this is a cyanobacteria. And so this is a blue green algae. And you can see all of these membranes here that wrap around this central part. Now in this organism, this is where the energy is made. So you don't need a mitochondria to make energy, but you do need this membrane type structure to make energy. Um, and so I'll just flip forward. So this is the last slide. I wanted to sort of show you this because this is an incredibly beautiful slide. So this is, this is the retina, the back of the eye. So this is the the back of the eye and the light is coming in up this way and this is the outer layer of neurons in the eye and this is what they look like when you look at them uh, on a schematic so you have the nucleus which is the blue part here and they're all really tightly packed together um, and then you have this inside bit which is called the inner segment and that's where the mitochondria are supposed to be so they're in this segment and outside of here you've got the bits that harvest the light pigment. So these are the bits that give you vision in the dark. So these allow you to see, and there's no mitochondria here. So the general thinking is that the mitochondrial energy fuel, the ATP as we call it, just diffuses up this tiny stalk and it gets up here. And there's enough of, of that going on to make the energy. But the things to remember, this, these are the most energy needy systems in the body and they need a huge amount of energy to do that. So it's never really, I never thought this could work. How does this work? There's not enough energy. So about 15 years ago, an Italian group basically came up with a theory that said that some of the mitochondrial proteins were actually here. And so this is just to show you. So this is a schematic of this outside part. This is the outside bit of that thing on the previous slide, the casing. And this is the, the guts of it that makes the energy. So this part makes the energy. So what I'm, I'm showing you here is that we have two components of mitochondria a red one and a green one. And when you get them in the same place in a mitochondria, they should be orange. And you can see here 
This is a cone cell. This is a cell that is involved in light vision and they're orange, okay? And there's orange parts here. And this is in this segment here. So they should be orange here. But what we're seeing is that this part here, which is the, the, the bit that makes the energy is in the wrong place and it's just green. So this part of the cell is green here uh, and it's not orange. And so we basically got this part or this, this thing here is in the wrong part of the cell. And this is really counterintuitive to what we really believe. And we have other data that's supporting this. So this is something I thought I'd throw in because I think this could be really important and we can come as to why perhaps at the, at the end after I finish the main talk. So just some science and beautiful picture. Um, and this is the type of stuff we can do in the lab. So what do we do in my group? So we work in two areas. We work on chronic diseases. Um, so this is MECFS. We've just started to start working in long COVID and chronic Lyme disease. And we want to look at, can we understand the biology of these conditions? You know, they're clearly, they're not all made up. There's no way uh, that the patients are, this is not in, all in the mind. It could be all in the mind, but it could be all in the mind for a different reason, a biological reason. And we want to try and identify new targets for treatment. And the other work we do, which I'll just mention briefly, is we, we are developing drugs that target cancer cell mitochondria, as I showed you on the previous slide. And these are really quite interesting molecules. And so what we've done, um, we've taken antibiotics and we've stuck a molecule on the outside that allows those to get into the mitochondria. They wouldn't otherwise get in. So you know, we take antibiotics uh, sometimes when we have an infection and they're quite safe. But what we've done is we've targeted a group here and that gets them into the mitochondria. And what I want to, so perhaps as, you, as I go through my talk, you'll see how these molecules can't, could may be useful in chronic diseases where we think there could be sort of organisms that are present in the patients. Because not only will they target the mitochondria, because these organisms came from mitochondria thousands and millions of years ago, there's a good chance that they could also be quite effective on some of these persistent pathogens that we think are playing a role. And I'll, and I'll let you think about that as we go through. And so we're very interested in these persistent pathogens and disease. And as I said, we worked a lot in MECFS, moving into these other areas, but all of these other conditions are really chronic. And we don't really understand what causes fibromyalgia. We don't really know what causes multiple sclerosis and pans, pandas and endometriosis. Too, um, these are big, big problem areas. Um, and so there's a growing number of these conditions where we really don't understand. So what I'm gonna to suggest to you is that maybe this infectious element or pathogens could be important in all of these, not just the MECFS, but all of these conditions. Um, so it doesn't really take me to tell you, 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 you you about this really so this is a really horrible condition for many reasons you know it's really difficult and as her from patrick you know it really does take your life away and i, I don't have it which is which is you know, fortunate for me but i know jamie and jamie this is jamie and his mum who came to my early talk this is jamie's sister laura and she's really ill with MECFS. and when you see people like this in a video or i see them in a in a meeting when i gave a talk last week to the local group um they look fine but I know they're not fine. I know they took a huge effort to attend the meeting we had in the in the hospital. And then when they go away, they're going to really suffer because of it. And then you have people like William Defoe. He's got a famous father, Ron Davis, uh, who, who's funded by the Open Medicine Foundation. And they're just left at home and nobody really takes any care of them. You know, Patrick had a great family, but sometimes these people. So there's people that are sort of missing from their lives. Other people that you walk around and you wouldn't know they were really sick. And this is a real, something for me, someone that's not affected with this illness is something I have to get my head around and I'm really quite, quite clear with it now. So I don't need to explain this to you because you're all very aware of that. In terms of problems, it's a massive problem. Uh, an even bigger now problem we've had COVID and the people with long COVID. There's, six, there's probably 2 million people in the UK with long COVID. Some of them are improving, but not all of them are improving. And so it's, it's going to be a, a major problem and most people in 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 the, in the world don't get a diagnosis you know, they may get an exclusion diagnosis over time but really there's no way of rapidly diagnosing this disease and that's something i'll talk about in my second part of the talk and as i said earlier patients predominantly female so why 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 did these conditions affect females preferentially and that's something we need to turn and understand so just to understand chronic disease in general. So this is long COVID as a schematic, but it could be any of these other conditions, uh, MECFS or maybe fibromyalgia. So, so people ended up with long COVID. Most people fortunately don't get long COVID after being infected with COVID-19. 
Um, so why? So why do some people, why they are, and they're susceptible for some reason we don't really know. So is the COVID-19 the trigger? Was the COVID the thing that triggered the, the disease? Or had things been going on before that we're not aware of? And slowly they were moving into this state. And we need to try and understand that. But clearly it's hard to look back and pull out what was going wrong because we don't really have any evidence uh, for that. So there was a trigger. And in this case, it looks like it was COVID-19. And then you have the situation now where you have something what is driving the disease now you know they had a virus many many years ago in some cases why are they still sick and what is causing that and that's what we really need to understand and then we'd like to offer treatments you know, a lot of the symptoms are pretty the, the pops are pretty horrendous really hard to deal with can we provide treatments that can help with some of the sort of comorbidities that people suffer from and that's really important to try and do that and so this is a sort of schematic, really, just a simple schematic. So I think there's people, there's vulnerable people out there for, for reasons that we'll come on to. Um, we could think about what might make somebody vulnerable. And they're pretty healthy at this point in time. A trigger comes in, it can be a virus, it can be a, a life stress event. Um, EBV is a, is a big trigger, glandular fever. And then you enter this chronic disease state if you're unlucky. And then so what we have now is is this and so we want to try and understand well, what's going on with these what what are the what, lots of symptoms what are the what's the biology what's the biology behind the symptoms can we look at biochemistry factors but the real key thing now is to what's causal you know many symptoms um some of them probably aren't causal they're, they're because of something else so what is that something else and that is what we really have to find out if we're going to do something to to, to cure this condition uh, not just alleviate the symptoms, we need to know what is driving it now and is, is it, are there things there. And I think we're getting closer to that over time. So this is just a, some, a paper republished just to show you uh, and what's different between this condition and another one. So we have on this graph lots of symptoms, probably struggle to see them, but you know, exercise intolerance, POTS, you know, the, the cognitive problems and healthy controls here. You know, there's a few red bits. So the red is the more red you are, the more severe the symptoms. And you can see if you go from the mild to moderate to severe patients, there's more red on this. We don't see this statistically different um, on the clinical features on the questionnaire between the three groups. And so the mild, moderates, and severes look pretty similar. When we look at them statistically, there's more red on, on the severe, but it's not significant. Um, the, the ME me the ms group again they're not that different from these ones and they don't come out as significant when we look at just the questionnaires alone um so many many conditions have a fatigue component and so this is one of those and so the question is you know what is causing the fatigue is it a similar thing across many conditions so this is a really interesting slide and it, and it sort of highlights possible susceptibility so this was a paper that came out of the bristol group so in the UK, there was an ALSPAC cohort that was put together in the 1970s. They took 10,000 babies and they were going to track them through their lives. And so we have nice longitudinal data. So people um, you know, have been diagnosed eventually with ME-CFS. And then we can look back at their records and see, well, what was going on? And this is the adult group. There's also a, a ch children group in this cohort. And you can see that they were diagnosed with the, the blue star, took a long time, but they were going to the clinicians um, 15 years before with problem. So there's a slow burn here to the final diagnosis, not just with the con consultations, but prescriptions per year were higher than the controls, uh, even 15 years referrals per patient. So something was going on in, the, in these individuals before they were diagnosed a long, long time. So there's something happening that, that we need to try and get a handle on. And what was interesting was that the, the children, the, the, the child charter group, 15, things were going on from birth pretty much. So there was something happening from birth that was a clue that this, there's something going on in these patients that's not just the final trigger. Um, there, there was something not quite right for a long time. Um, and so, so what might make somebody vulnerable to a chronic disease? And so you could think about maybe there's, there's something in the genes, a, a genetic component. And there's a big study just starting in the UK to look for these sort of genome-wide associations. So these are, these are small th things that could add up to give somebody a susceptibility. So you have the DNA, you have an epigenetic component, which is basically um, like the DNA, but it's something that could be impacted by environment. So I sat through a talk many years ago about um, pregnant women who smoked. And there was changes in the mother's blood because um, of the smoking.
but the babies had the same changes 40 years afterwards in their blood. So there are factors that could influence maybe somebody in utero or in early life. You get a virus that could change epigenetic factors and that could have an influence along the line. So it's more than just the DNA, but these are changes that have been reprogrammed, if you like, into the, into the DNA. And that could cause a chronic disease. And that's the obvious one to think about that would make somebody vulnerable. But I want to put another one in the mix here. So, so maybe other things might also make you vulnerable. So perhaps you inherited something that was a bad factor. You know, um, there are There is evidence in autism, for example, of bacteria that are spread from the placenta by the mother to the child. Um, you know, not very many people have studied this, but there could be things like this that were maybe transmitted from birth or early on that you picked up at low levels that could then, when you combine them with something else, so maybe you get COVID and you have a factor that could then lead to a chronic disease. And so this could also be transmissible. So it's not just the DNA that could be transmissible, that could make somebody vulnerable. There could be other factors that are that happen like that. And so being female it makes you more vulnerable. So this is a demographic of the sort of key areas where people are diagnosed and the, the, the red is the women and the men are in blue. And you can see here, there's two peaks. Looks like there's something happening around 15 years old and then something around 35. So, so what's the difference between men and women? There are many differences between men. But when, you, when I look at this graph and knowing what I'm gonna talk about later on, so you know, puberty comes in here about 15 and you have a menstrual cycle you know and so you could be more vulnerable to to maybe infection not not infections in those sort of the, the big sense but maybe things can get in that, that you don't really want in that can cause trouble if you can't deal with them childbirth is another one you know between around about this time people having babies not everybody has babies but maybe this is linked here again a vulnerability childbirth changes lots of things your immune system changes during childbirth there's also hormonal shifts with women that we don't get in men um, it could be playing a role. So many things that could be influencing this, but we need it really not quite sure which ones to go for. So, so in terms of what we know about MECFS, over the last five years, there's a lot more coming out. And what I'm going to do is this is just lists a few: so autoimmunity, gut dysbiosis, metabolic disturbances, energy, um, autonomic function, immune cell issues. I'm going to just summarize what we know um, and then bring in some of our work to cover these areas. So we've we've come a long way, I think, in the last five years, still doing small studies because the budgets are too small, but people are reproducing other people's work and that's always a big valuable thing to do. And the, the same things are cropping up all the time. This is a busy slide, you've got the slides. I know I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail. Um, autoantibodies, this group, some of the groups think these are really important. You can get rid of them by sort of plasma exchange and some people will improve, not everybody but it's a short term fix. So people will improve and then they'll go back again. So, you know, it's not a complete cure. B cell depletion was something that was done in Norway. It, it doesn't really work. When you run proper trials, there really wasn't any short term or long term benefit from B cell de depletion with Tixamab. However, the cyclophosphamide that they picked up early on with the sort of the, the, the lymphoma cancer patients did show benefit in the long term. And I think there's a paper coming out by the group quite shortly. So, this is an interesting drug, it's a poison. So the question is, how is it improving? What is it doing? Who is it poisoning? Is it doing something uh, different from what it was proposed to be doing with the immune system? Um, and then the ones in red are linked to perhaps infectious elements or pathogens. So antimicrobial peptides, two studies have found these elevated in plasma. Um, there's no evidence of a full-blown infection, which is one of the problems in, um, so there isn't anything going on that you can really hang your hat on. Um, there is evidence of end, end, uh, endogenous retroviral at reactivation, particularly with long COVID. We're seeing lots of not, not viruses that you may have had as a child that are, that are being coming out and being reactivated. So that's interesting. So it's suggesting there's a problem with the immune system, maybe. And this monocyte activation, which we're seeing quite commonly, what, what's doing that? Is something driving? So monocytes are the things that respond to pathogens and they're being reactivated. So does that mean you've got more pathogens? But the general thinking at the moment, this is this is a bad thing that's going on and this is causing some of the problems. But I'm wondering whether it's not a bad thing at all. It could be a good thing. And it's telling us something about what's going on in the patient. So this is quite a big list and you can look at that uh, afterwards. The other area where there's a lot of interest now, and again, it's a, a space that is seems to be consistent so many studies now have linked 
So gut dysbiosis, which is sort of a uh, a narrow narrow gut microbiome, so not enough diversity in your bacteria in your bowel, is associated with MSFS, and also it gives you a leaky gut. So this will allow things to get more easily into the body, into the blood system, and maybe that combine the leaky gut combined with the dysbiosis is part of the issue. Um, what bacteria are important? There's evidence of ones that make butyrate that seem to be lacking in the patients, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So they're commonly low. Several studies have compared to healthy controls, and they're low, and that could be significant. However, this gut dysbiosis is not just in MESFS. It's found in cancer patients, Parkinson, autism, PANS, a lot of conditions. So is it just the fact that they're ill, or is it something a bit more important? So is the gut dysbiosis in MESFS different from the others? And we were actually putting together a study with some private clinic data, and it does look like it might be. It look, looks like the MECFS gut dysbiosis might be unique to MECFS and not has different features to the other conditions that we've looked at. So that's one to, to think about. And so if you improve your gut flora, can that improve symptoms? There's been some studies around fecal transplants, not been studied properly, no real big clinical trials. And so I think the jury's out on this, and no one's really run the proper studies to really to do this and also you know getting a protocol to do this it's not really been worked up properly it's not like giving a drug um you have to really work out how to do that and so so again interesting area um but again where does it sit you know is this a cause or is this a consequence of the illness and these are the questions we need to answer as we look at all of these different things that are different there's no doubt they're different energy metabolism is a key one um so the top two here this is a newcastle group found a few years ago if you take blood cells from patients and you look at their ability of their energy systems to work, they're not as good as the controls. Um, paper by um, Warren Tate, actually who I met five years ago, I went to visit him in Dunedin when I was over here, lovely guy. And uh, we've been in a bit of contact since. He published a paper showing that there was lots of evidence again of this mitochondrial dysfunction in the patients. These two studies at the bottom are really important. So this one here is taking muscle from a patient. So what we, what we can do with muscle Inside a muscle, when you exercise or you know you pull a muscle, you can rebuild it, and you have cells in your muscle called stem cells that can remake the fibers and re and they're really good. There's lots of them in there, and we can grow those cells in the lab. So what this group did was they took the the stem cells, so not muscle, they put it in a dish, and they could regenerate that cell to make muscle fibers. And what was really interesting is that those cells had hallmarks of energy energy dysfunction. So these weren't, weren't muscle cells in the patient, but cells from the patient. So this suggested at the time, there could be some genetic component of these cells that, that predispose to this mitochondrial abnormality. And this other study from Australia, from Daniel Missalides and Paul Fisher, took the blood cells from the patients and they basically immortalized them. And the way you do that is you infect them with Epstein-Barr virus, which is one of the common viruses that we think could be driving this condition. And the really interesting thing that they found was this, when they did this, it increased the energy um, of the cells for the normal ones and, and the disease ones, but it really caused a real dis disproportionate numbers of these proteins in the mitochondria. So again, there was a different response of this transformation, specifically in the MECFS patients. So again, there's something sort of in the cells, um, when they go into the dish or when you do something with the virus, that, that makes them different. And the key thing is to try and work out what this is. And I'll come back to that a bit later. And this is the bit we're really excited about. So, you know, for the last, I've been working in this space for six years now. And when we go to the big funders, we don't have a hypothesis. We go in and we say, we want to look at all of the, the, the compounds in the blood or study mitochondria. And we don't really stand a chance because we don't really have a real hypothesis, which is what you really need to compete. So we need to be able to say, we think X is causing this illness. We're going to study it in these ways and, and we're going to prove that it, either it does or doesn't cause the condition. And I think we're getting close to having good ones. So this is the one that we favor. So we think that these persistent pathogens could play a role in this disease. And we think we can study them in the, in the lab. So why do we think that? So the first one is something I mentioned previously. These two molecules here are released when you have an infection. It's, it's not like a full-blown infection, so somebody has sepsis. You have big factors that come into play. This, these are quite low levels in the patients, but they're upregulated and they're there. Monocytes respond to an infection. Again, we see activation 
in the patients, but could be evidence. Viruses from previous infections could be playing a role. So this is another type of pathogen that could be, could be important. Um, we find in these blood cells that this epigenetic factors that I mentioned before, you know, the ability of the cells genes to be expressed is changed in ME. So things are changed. It would allow things to be coming out of the cells that don't normally come out. And I sat through some really interesting talks. I was in a, a Lyme, a chronic Lyme meeting actually uh, in Boston a few weeks ago, and somebody was looking at um, this organism here. So Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete that causes Lyme disease. I don't think it's a big problem in, in Australia. For New Zealand. Maybe in New Zealand it is, I know, not in Australia, so I shouldn't say that. That's probably uh, go down not very well. But in Scotland, in the UK, there's a, there's a real problem with Lyme disease from these ticks that bite patients and spread this parasite. But it's not just Borrelia that spread. It's many other nasties, viruses, bacteria that are spread by this tick. So, so it's really hard to find these in the patients. So somebody with chronic Lyme disease won't get a diagnosis, a bit like MECFS, um, because there's nothing to pick up. And there's no ELISA test, which is a protein-based test. These pathogens are found in really low, low levels, so you may not pick them up. So what this group have done, um, the group in the UK, in Leicester, have developed a test where rather than picking up the bacteria, they try and pick up the, the viruses that infect them. So this horrible looking thing here is a virus called a phage that infects the bacteria. So it basically sits on the surface of the bacteria and it injects the DNA into the bacteria. And it's harmless to us, but it's, it's catastrophic to Borrelia. So it will kill Borrelia um, and it will infect more Borrelia. So you can imagine you have one, one or two parasites floating around in the blood, you're gonna to struggle to pick them up, but you could have tens or hundreds of these and that's what they try and pick up. And I saw some really interesting data on MECFS patients from Belgium with a really high frequency of these phage that are, are infecting Borrelia. So it just make you wonder how many other patients are diagnosed with this, but perhaps they have a chronic Lyme. But again, at the moment, we can't really diagnose it. And so, and finally, I'm gonna talk a bit more about this. So we, we got together with a company a few years ago called Soft Cell Biologicals, and they've done some really exciting work, not published, but I'll mention that going on. So, so what we really need to do with these conditions is to, is to work out which of these associate with the condition and which ones are causal. So are any of these causal that we can then try and break the, the, the cycle, if you like, to reduce the symptoms? And, and so our money is on the pathogens at the moment, and that's the where we're focusing. So this is based on all of those things here. Energy metabolism is key. Um, and I think these persistent pathogens are really relevant to the condition and they could be driving lots of the things that we see. I don't have time today to talk about the link with the mitochondria. Maybe I'll come back in a few years time and we'll get a bit further forward for that. But I think there's a really interesting connection between these pathogens from A, where they came from evolutionary and what they're doing now inside cells when they get in the same place as a mitochondria. And, and that's perhaps something for another day. And so I'm just gonna mention the microbiome. You probably heard of the microbiome, um, mainly around the gut. And I mentioned that just briefly. So. We have about 1.5 kilograms of bacteria in our body. Is that in fact there's more bacteria than human cells in a human, uh, mainly in the bowel, but we do have bacteria on our skin. And we now know that we have bacteria inside our tissues. And these are common. So this is not just patients with an illness. These are found in healthy people. So commensal bacteria. And the question is, what are they doing? Are they doing anything useful? Um, or are they just there by chance and we deal with them and we keep the levels down and they're involved in um, tissue repair and the skin. This paper came out a while ago and in the gut, they do lots of things. So this is a, a, the bowel. Interestingly, about 70 percent of your immune function is in the bowel. So it's a really important organ for the driving and immune response. So what does what does the bowel do? So it protects us from pathogens. So it's a barrier. Um, bacteria in your bowel can make vitamins, different types. Um, as I said, it's really crucial for the development of the immune system. So even very early, when, when people, babies are born, when babies are born, they have nothing in their bowel and they have to repopulate their bowel. They do that in the first few years of life. And how they do that uh, is an interesting question. And I'll come back to that in a second. So you start with nothing and then you end up with a bowel full of the right bacteria and a, a mixture of good bacteria and what you don't want is a, back, is a bowel full of bacteria that are probably all one type. You know? And diet is crucial here. You know, you, you eat um, convenience foods. It can really impact on the bowel um, and your genesis. 
And these two things here, the bowel can store fats. And th these two over here are really important for this talk. So the gut actually can modulate the brain. It's really quite interesting. And the brain can modulate the gut. You know, if you get a bit stressed, the first thing that you feel is funny is your guts. And that's the brain stimulating the bowel. And we know that it works the other way. So there are bacteria in the bowel that make these short chain fatty acids and they can activate the brain or help with the brain. We don't quite understand how, but what's interesting is the ones that are deficient in ME patients, these butyrate producers, which is a short chain fatty acid are, are lacking in patients. So could there be a lack of a molecule made by the bacteria in an ME patient that could be causing a problem and causing some of the symptoms? And diversity is key. I mentioned, you know, we have between 1200 and 1500 species in our gut. If you lived in the Amazon rainforest and you had a, you didn't eat McDonald's, you'd have 4,000. Um, so, so there's this diversity is something that we naturally had many, many years ago. And now we've narrowed it down. And maybe this is part of the problem that we don't have enough gut bacteria um, that, are, that are diverse. And we need to change our diet. I was at a talk the other week and they were saying that some of these tribes in Africa, they eat 60 kilos of fiber a day. They eat sort of roots and things. And so, you know, we're never going to do that, but you could improve um, the bowel. And antibiotics, um, some of them are pretty bad. So this one, clindamycin, um, there's some studies came out from this group, seven day course, it messes up the diversity for two years. Um, and in the US now, by the age of 10, kids have been on 10 courses of antibiotics. And so, so these are all factors that could influence the bowel. Um, but again, not everybody will get these conditions. So it's part of the of the of the of the package, but perhaps not the more the key one. Um and again, looking more so the gut is important, but the, the, the gut microbiome can actually modulate cancer drug effectiveness. And so there's these new immune checkpoint inhibitors, they're really quite good, they work very well. But if you have the wrong microbiome, they don't work. And that's not just in that's in mice and in humans. And so you have to have the right microbiome for these cancer drugs to work so again it's pushing the and also that the lung microbiome can regulate the brain so so it's not just the gut it's all of these different organisms so we have to think about not just the human but all these other things that colonize us that could be playing a role in in good health or poor health um when you're born i mentioned this so when you're born um if you're born um by by natural delivery or cesarean section there's a real difference in how you respond to vaccines depending upon how you're born. So all of these factors play a, play a key role. Um, so coming back to this, this is probably the most important slide really around the, these pathogens. So I met soft cell biologicals about five years ago. They were set up by a guy called Brent Hunt and he'd suffered all of his life with fibromyalgia, joint pains. He'd had lots of, he had, he had his shoulder replaced twice, knees. And he, he wasn't a scientist. He was a sort of a builder by trade pretty smart he could have gone to medical school and he did something that nobody else has really done he thought well why why is this happening to me i'm gonna look at my blood and he took his blood and he put it on a slide and he looked at it under a microscope and he did it lots of times and he saw things in his blood that he thought were a bit unusual he didn't have anybody else's blood to compare it to so he set up a business and so he set up this company and what they did was they they looked initially at blood on a on a on a microscope slide live Normally what happens is when you go into hospital, they'll take a blood smear and they dry it. Nobody look, nobody will look at a live blood sample in a NHS hospital because they don't have the capacity to do it, but they did this. And so on the back of this, they decided they could see things in the blood. You can see here this little green spot inside a cell um, in, the, in the blood of a patient. And so they, they generated a protocol to culture what are L4 bacteria. So these are wallless bacteria. You can see here, I've got a better slide in a second. So normally bacteria will have a cell wall. So they'll either have a sort of a tough one, um, a gram positive, or a more sort of um, jelly-like one, a gram negative bacteria. So we have two general types of bacteria and all of these bacteria, or most of them, have the capability to form a bacteria that doesn't have a wall. And when you do that, you form these very strange looking structures. So a bacteria, if you ever go on Google and look at a bacteria, they divide, they get lots of sort of, sort of massive escalation of these, lots of sort of building blocks. But these are a bit like a, there's a, a mothership here and it's producing all these tiny vesicles. This is a culture from a patient. And again, this is a different strain of bacteria without a wall and it's producing a completely different structure. So what they found 
Um, and this has, hasn't been published, so this is all quite novel work and needs to be reproduced, was that the, the, the conditions that could produce the most culturable organ L forms, this type of bacteria, were the people with ME-CFS and ME-CFS and fibromyalgia. The people with autoimmune diseases were, were somewhere in the middle. The average sample produced, you know, just just a normal somebody with a disease or something in general. There's over 2,000 people that did this on, gave you about five. But healthy people can also produce cultures of these L forms. And as you age, the numbers of, of culturable L forms in healthy people in, increases. And so as, a, as an age response, we get less good at, we have more of these pathogens or these organisms, I wouldn't say they're pathogens over time, but they're, they're quite common in the, these diseases that we don't understand. So the other thing they did was they did some sort of sequencing of the bacteria and they found many, many different types of bacteria. So you we always think, I used to think that your blood's sterile, there's nothing in it, but they were finding lots of bacteria, viruses, fungi in people's samples, not huge levels, but high enough to, to make you wonder what was different. And, and I haven't got time to really talk about it today, but they found many more bacteria in these patients than in the control. So you've got more types. Um, and what's happened in the last few years we're starting to see this in other forms of science. So in cancer, the, the immune cells around the tumors are full of intracellular bacteria. And also pancreatic cancer, the, the actual response of the treatment is determined by the microbiome or these bacteria around the tumor. So it's becoming more common and we're seeing this in lots of areas of science now. So in MECFS, there seems to be more of these things, but they're not unique. So we need to try and get a handle of for what's different. What, why, why, why is there more and what's going on here? And are these things involved in not just cancer, but other processes as well? And so this is a bit of a bigger blow up of that. So we've just started our research into these pathogens. So, I've, so Fran is only for a day and a half a week. We got some money from a, a Lyme Foundation in America, and we're just going to send our first samples off to be sequenced uh, at this at the deep pathogen level to look for viruses, fungi from a chronic Lyme cohort next week. And then the, the, the plan is to then move with Inga's project into the chronic MECFS space. So, so watch this space and we need to have a look. So we're, we're looking for clues, we're looking for pathogens. And if we find them, there's an awful lot we can do. So another part of the work that we've done a lot of is um, looking for clues in the blood. And so you've probably heard of genomics. So genomics looks at the DNA of the patient. You know, we can sequence all of it and find out what's in there. And we get getting very good at uh, looking for mutations and things that might cause disease. And then these other things, so you, your DNA makes RNA, which is called the transcriptome. We can sequence that and find out everything that's going on. And this is all modern technology allows us to do that, even down, down to the level of a single cell, which is quite incredible. And then we can look at the proteins that come off the RNA. So these are the things that, you know, do the jobs, make um, make the material, make those things that go in the mitochondria. There's the proteins, and then we can study those. But the key area that we've been working on is called metabolomics. So what metabolomics does, it looks at chemicals, and you can look at chemicals in a tissue or or in urine or in the blood. And we tended to focus on the blood. Now it's not an omics like these ones. So an omics means that you can see everything. With metabolomics, we can't pick up everything. We can pick up known compounds that we know about in our library, but the bulk of the things that we find, we can see them, but we don't know what they are. So we can't really make any conclusions as to how they play a role. And that's been a challenge and I'll, I'll take you through that. So, so what are we doing? We're, we're looking at the blood to get a, get a readout of what's going on in the rest of the patient. So this is metabolism. I won't test you on this. In the middle, you've got the energy part that makes the energy. So very complicated, lots of enzymes, molecules. And we're basically looking at these molecules, the A, Bs, and Cs, and D that come from your brain, your liver, your kidney, your tissues that end up in the plasma, the blood plasma. And we can sample that and we can detect them. And so that's what we do. But it's not just a patient now, is it? There's all these other things that are going on. You may have bacteria. You do have bacteria in the body. You may have some viruses going on. People take medications. You know, as you get older, we're on more medications. And there's also things in the environment, a lot of discussion around mold and toxic chemicals that could. So all of these things may influence what we find. So we get a complex mixture of things. And so at the moment, 
you know, if you're an MECFS patient, you go backwards and forwards to the doctor and you can't find anything. So what we're trying to do is to make take that to another level. So there's, there's standard tests that are validated to test things, but they're quite simple. And we don't really have a have a clue as to what's going on. So what we're trying to do is to look at all of the chemicals in the blood and try and work out whether we can see a signature. So are there things in the blood that we think could drive the disease? Are we going to find things that are associated with the disease? But are there anything, are there things there that could be causal? So as I said, we have some knowns. We have things that we can get quite close to identify and then unknowns. But um, sadly, the bulk of things are in the unknown. And then we'll have lots of junk and noise and rubbish. And we need to be able to filter that out so we don't look at it. And so this is the, sort of the big idea uh, in terms of what we're trying to do. So we have we sample the plasma and all of these things will contribute to it. We don't know where things come from. Um, we can get some clues. If we if we find a factor that comes from the liver, then we know it's from the liver. But you know, other things are in there that we don't know what they're from. But it's not that straightforward. So you have a condition like this. So the ME, CFS factors are the yellow ones. If it was like this, it'd be easy, but it's not easy. You have um, people are ill. So things were going to go up and down. So if somebody's severely ill, they're going to be probably lying down, as Patrick said, in, in a room, sheltering from light. They're not going to be very active. So their muscles are going to be behaving very differently. So things are going to change that aren't relevant to the causal factors just because people are really sick. Um, other, other things in here um, could be modulated by the illness as well. You know, So the illness might change things. But things like age, BMI, sex, we're all going to have an influence on this if somebody's depressed, anxious, lack of sleep. So again, it's a complicated, we have to try and control for all these things. We could control for age, BMI and sex, you know, by recruiting people of, of a certain type. We can try and exclude people with depression. That's that's like the this, people with depression can be fatigued, but we don't want somebody in a study on MECFS that's depressed. It's a key cause. But how do you exclude them? It's really quite complicated to do. So this is where Jamie came in. So Jamie was involved with the analysis. So we had a great cohort from Poland. We got a fantastic collaboration with a Polish group that do really good clinical assessments. So these are mild patients, um, some moderates, but mainly mild. In Poland, when I talked to Paul, he studied in Newcastle with Julian Newton, who was a great clinician in this area. And he went back to Poland and he said, oh, I've been studying this in Newcastle. And then he tried and it, and it doesn't exist in Poland. In Poland, there's no such thing as MECFS. And I think that's still true now. So he had to go through this huge screening process of, of tens of thousands of people. So when you open up a study, you get 10,000 people who want to be involved, even though it doesn't exist in Poland. So he pre-screened them through. He used an older criteria um, to diagnose them, but he did a really thorough workup. So these people came into the doctor's they were assessed for post-exertion malaise, which is crucial. They saw a psychiatrist, neurologist, and they tried to make that cohort as tight as they could. You know, we're not excluding people um, for the sake of it, but we want to try and get the cohort because it's going to be really complicated, the data. And we want to make sure that we get as pure a population as we can, knowing that it isn't going to be that pure. There's going to be heterogeneous. Um, they came to the clinic, so they were really rapidly sampled for the blood. They were quickly processed and they were quite nicely spaced out in terms of the age, but you don't always get a factor. So really good cohort. So what did we find? Um, we found lots of compounds. And so you can see the numbers are huge on here. So we do a couple of methods or four methods. We pick up different chemicals in the blood. And the key thing to take home, these are the ones that we know what they are. So, you know, you're looking at probably 500 now, but we probably think there's 12,000 metabolites in the blood that are relevant. And so we're not really looking at everything. So it's very hard to make big calls on the blood at the moment as to what might be driving the symptoms, but we can do quite a lot. So this is a nice plot. So this is some statistics. Um, so what we've done here is we've, we've used a sort of a computer statistical program to say, this is our data. So each one of these points is a patient and there's 12,000 variables in each patient. And we say to the computer, here's the data, can you group them? And it does. And it groups the red ones together here, which are the controls, and the green ones are separate here. But you can see here that the green ones are much more spread out. So you've got green ones that are on the edge here. So there's there's more than one type of ME patient that are quite different. But what's quite nice is that the how tight the control group is. So that was really good because you don't normally get this separation when you do this with blood. This is quite a surprise that it was really this good. What people tend to do is you tell the computer, you know, I've got two groups. This is my control group. This is my ME group. And you tell it to, can you tell them apart? 
and it's less, um, there's a bit more bias here. So you get a better separation and this is what people normally do. So we'd, we could see that there was a difference here. Uh, and these R2 and Q2 values, the numbers are high, which means there's something in this data that could be different. So then we go away and look at it. And so these are our top compounds that can separate the groups. So the thing to notice is that the ME patients are all lower than the controls. So these are our top variables. So these are the things that separate those groups apart. But the sad thing is, we don't know what any of them are. We know they're really relevant, but we can't really say much. And I've tried several times to get funding to look at these. At the moment, we have to go to the charities and they don't really want to fund me to look at a bunch of compounds. We don't know what they are. But then if we find out that they're really relevant in another cohort, we can start to dig down and there are ways of getting closer to what they are. Um, but some things we do know. And so this is a, a nice plot of that. So this is called a volcano plot. So this middle part here with a little box across here is the center of the volcano. And what happens is things spew over the outside, like in a volcano. Um, you've got one in New Zealand. I, I walked across the Tongariro crossing actually when I was there last time. Um, so, so things that are on this side are lower than the controls and things on this side are higher than the controls in red. And so what you see on this side is there's lots of amino acids and things that we already know from other studies that are low. So this, this is nice because it sort of confirms that what we're finding is consistent with other things. And some people think that these low levels of metabolites could link to energy metabolism. Uh, over this side is less, um, but there's some interesting ones. So glutamate is a neurotransmitter. We're finding it at quite high levels in the blood. It shouldn't really be at that high levels in the blood. And I'll come back, back to that in a minute. This one here is, is really very on the extreme. Now, none of these come up on the previous analysis. So these aren't things that drive the difference. But what this means, there are some things that are really different. This is a gram negative bacterial cell wall component, which we shouldn't be seeing. So this means that some of the patients have probably a very high level because it's so extreme um, levels of, of bacteria, which fits with what soft cell are saying. And that's something we're trying to follow up on. Now, we haven't got much further with this. this is quite a new discovery. But what I will show you um, is the glutamate. So this is just to, to, to go back and say, you know, none of our things on that previous plot are coming up here, but that doesn't mean they're not important. And so we need to remember that as we go forwards. So this is the glutamate glutamine. So glutamine is a real common abundant molecule in blood. So it's shown in green. And the glutamate is the orange. And these are the healthy people. And they look quite similar, a bit of variation in height. These are the patients. And so you can see the orange, there's much more orange here. So this is the glutamate that was coming out as an outlier, but really different, but not everybody is different. So these ones over here, have got low glutamine, but their glutamate is not that different from the controls, but some of them are really different. So we think this is important. Where it fits in this association cause is another question, but it's glutamate something that could cause trouble in the brain. And we're very interested in this barrier, blood brain barrier leak, and we are finding evidence that it could be broken down in ME, CFS. And so, so this could be quite important and one to bear in mind going forwards. So, so I'm sort of about halfway through now. I hope you're all okay. I'll, I'll try and slow down a little bit. So I'm going to show you some of our more recent research. And so in the UK, we have something called the James Lind Alliance. This is set up by the patients and the patients will come up with their top 10 priorities. And when I write grants to the big funders, I have to take notice of this. And we do. And they come up with some really good um, suggestions. So these are the top three. So they, the patients really want to understand what is causing this hideous post-exertional malaise that they suffer from. Um, what is it? What's causing it? How should they manage it? And that's really important to them. The second one is, you know, some people say that this drug worked for them. Others say it didn't. How do we test that? How can we explore existing drugs? And how can we work out who, say, low-dose dose naltrexone helps or, or amaltriptyline will helps? And so can we do more of that? And the third one, there's no test, you know, you don't get tested, you get told there's nothing wrong with you. We want a test that can tell the doctor that I've got MECFS, I get properly managed and supported and not left at home. And that's and that's where we've come in. So we've come in on this diagnostic test and these are the people that have done the work. So we were really lucky to work with a group in engineering, uh, Wei Huang. This is a Raman microscope and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. Uh, this is a cell on the microscope. and 
you get really lucky sometimes with students. So Yabawa was a an engineering student with Wei. Um, I got introduced to Wei and I said, well, can we look at this ramen to look at our um, uh, MECFS cells? You know, they look really interesting. And Yabawa took this on as part of her project. And she's just been fantastic. She, she did a PhD, published 10 papers, which is quite incredible. Um, did a postdoc and now we actually left, lost her to Glasgow but we still want to work with her because she's just brilliant, particularly with the actual machine learning and on all of the data I'll present is hers. So Sarah was in my group. So during the pandemic, we had a, an interesting grant where we worked with Hariba who made the microscopes. And we were looking to see, I wanted to look at the cells and see whether I could see the mitochondria in a cell and see what it was doing. And that was the sort of thrust of this. Could we go in and interrogate it? Because sometimes you don't get very many cells in some of our other work. And what about where all mitochondria doing the same things? I talked about pathogens earlier and, and mitochondria do interact with pathogens. So should I go in and look at this? And so that was the thrust of the project. And so, so we're looking at Raman, which I'll mention in a second, at the single cell. So this is a cell, you have a DNA, the nucleus, I've mentioned the mitochondria, the DNA will make RNA and you can study that in a cell. You can look at proteins in a cell, but what we wanted to look at this metabolism. So when we do the metabolomics on the plasma, we're looking at the chemicals that are, are involved in a cell. And Raman can do this. It can look at the chemicals in the cell and give you either, a, a tell you what you've got or give you a fingerprint. And that's what I'll come on to. So how does it work? So what we do is we excite the material with a, with a laser down the microscope and we get this vibrational scatter. So a lot of the light will bounce off, but some of it will hit a bond and these bonds will vibrate. And it gives you a very weak energy, sort of one in 10 to the seven photons. We actually pick up cosmic rays with this microscope. It's quite bizarre. Uh, I can talk about that a bit later. So you get energy from molecules. So this type of ring structure will bounce the light off and we can pick that up and we measure that with a microscope. Um, and this is basically the microscope is lots of mirrors we excite with a laser on a sample. We get this vibrational energy. We then pick it up with a camera. And then we get a fingerprint. So this is a fingerprint of a biological sample. It could be blood, it could be a, a bit of plasma on a speck on the, on the slide. And we can see molecules and we can see what some of them are. So we have a fingerprint region here and then another one here, which is quite strong. And then we have a silent region in the middle. And so, so we want to see whether we can use this method in this case as a diagnostic. So can we find a healthy fingerprint based on this complicated spectra? Um, there's about 1,500 peaks we pick up on a biological sample. And can we find one that can be diagnostic of an illness? In this case, MECFS. Now, these look even these ones look really similar by eye. So it's not going to be easy. We're going to have to use something quite sophisticated. So we take these spectra and we apply a machine learning. You've probably heard about AI. There's lots of discussion about, could it be useful? Could it be bad? Who's going to get hold of it? And then at the end of the day, we want to try and come up with a diagnosis based on what we're seeing. And so this has been used, started to be used quite a lot. So in cancer, they took, so they wanted to see whether they could use this Rama method to, to diagnose cancer early. So early stage lung cancer, you know, you can treat it more easily, um, but can you diagnostic on a blood sample? Cells will secrete things called exosomes, tiny bags of stuff, a bit like the L forms, shed into the blood. And then, so what they did was they, looked at these exosomes by Raman, developed a fingerprint, and they got quite good at diagnosing this very early. So that's an example. And this is quite a cool one. So, so what they wanted to do here, you have a cancer tissue and a normal tissue. And the question is, can you determine a cancer cell from a normal cell based on its spectral profile? And they can. And so what they can do now is potentially if you if you are, so you're working in the brain or in a spinal cord and you're really close to the normal tissue, you could come in with a Raman laser and scan across the junction and make sure you got rid of all the cancer and, and didn't damage the normal cells. It's a bit slow at the moment to do this because it's quite a slow process. But in theory, this is something for the future where you could really cut out all of the tumor and, and not in places that are really hard to take any big margins that could be really exciting. So exciting developments in the cancer space. So what, what we're doing with it is we're trying to use it as a, a test. So we're looking at the cells, the PBMCs, which I mentioned earlier. So we already know that these cells have an energy problem. 
And so we take cells from normal people, showing green blood, take a blood sample, and we make these cells from the patient. And then we apply the instrument. So we shine a light on the cells and we develop a, a profile like this. And so the question is, can we diagnose into healthy and disease? Can we use that Raman to maybe separate out the groups? Can we, can we pick up a severe patient from a blood sample or not? And then do various things. And so a fingerprint is the first step and then we move on to the diagnosis. And so the question is, does it work? And I'll show you in a minute that it did. So quite a large cohort for ME, so almost 100 people, 61 in the ME group, split between the, the three groups, the mild, moderate, and severe. Um, and then not enough healthy, unfortunately. We, we lost a couple during the analysis. So what, what's worth mentioning is that when we look at the questionnaires and the mitochondrial respiration assays that didn't really work for our samples, we can't easily separate out the disease groups. So we can't separate the... ME, mild, moderate, and severe, and we can't separate the multiple sclerosis ones from them. So they're too similar. And this is this is a problem just based on this type of analysis. So what about the Raman? So, so this is a quite complicated slide. And so in green, we've got the all of the spectra. There's 25,000 spectra here. And we've got the average ones. So you can see the, the, the darker green line in the middle is the average. And then we've got the spread around that. And it's quite tight. You know, there are a few areas where it's quite diverse, but generally it's quite tight. Um, and then what we did here is we compared the red ME with the controls and the MS. And then we did a really basic machine learning method, which basically looks at features of this, of this profile. We can't look at the whole thing at the moment, but we're working on that. And we can, the groups popped out as separate, which is quite remarkable. We were quite surprised. Um, then we asked the next question, okay, we can separate the three groups like this but what about the different severity groups so in this figure here we've just put in we've put in the mild moderates and severes and what's really interesting is that the moderates and the severes that overlap the miles are different but but really nicely the controls are different the green and then when we add the ms patients in the mix as well so again we've got a complicated comparison here what's really interesting is severe has now come out as different and the ms the miles and moderates overlap and again, the healthy controls are quite different. And this is an interesting graph here. This is basically comparing the severe ME patients, the red ones, with the healthy controls and saying, what's different between a healthy control? Uh, if it was no different, it would run along the green line. And then we look at the MS patients compared to a healthy control. And if it was no different, it run along the green line. So you can see that there's difference between the MS and the green line. But what's interesting is that the ME and the MS ones are quite different. So in this part of the profile, they're different and here. So there's lots of things in this data that could be really useful. So what do we then do? So the LDA, these individual machine learning methods, there's six here, um, they're not very good on their own. So they get it better than chance. So if you have an unknown sample and you apply it, even though they separate really nicely, you need to be cautious of that. You need to do the statistics. Um, the best one is the random forest. It's one at the bottom. That can get it right 60% of the time. But what we did was we we, we did what's called a, a mixture of the, all the approaches. So you take the sample, you analyze it with a laser. We take um, five specs per cell. We take 30 cells per patient. So we average that. And then what we do is we take 80% of the data, all the data, and we develop what's called a training set. And then we say to the machine learning methods, well, okay, can you tell the training set anything about the training set? You know, can you separate the groups out? And it and it gets it right some of the time. Um, and then we have a test set and we come in and, and see whether it can get it right. And then what we do is we use this method to merge them all together and then come up with a final diagnosis. And because our samples are too small, we can't really do what we need to do is to hold some back and never look at it. So what we do is we we train on 80% of the data, and then we test on 20%, and we do a different test every time. So there's a different training set, and then we merge these together, and then we come up with some prediction. So at the moment, this is not a test. This is just encouraging. And so essentially using this method with an unknown sample in a test cohort, we can get it right 90% of the time. So at the moment, you can't get anything like this if you go to the doctors. They won't give you anything that can get this level of prediction. So nine out of 10 times, we get the MS patient put in the right group, the ME and the healthy controls. But what's really interesting, we can also do pretty well with the different severity types. So if we look at the severe, moderates and milds, we can get them right 
a lot of the time. So this is encouraging. And, and then the plan is to, to, to run a, a validation cohort, hopefully next. So this is great. What else can we do with it? This is a quite a nice method. We have something called Raman sorting. So we can actually sort cells based on their fingerprint. So we could pull out cells from that mixture and look at them with other methods. We can label uh, metabolism. And then we can combine with other things like wearables. You know, we can start to look at what's called multimodal data, not just looking at a questionnaire or Raman, but combining it. And this paper's just come out. It's really interesting. So they did this multimodal approach and got some really interesting data out of some GWAS data, which otherwise you wouldn't have got. So, so the future looking interesting for this. And I'll come back to this. This is our validation study, just trying to get the funding approved to do this in the new year. I've got one of my, um, Megan's going to finish her PhD. She's used to using Raman. It's not an easy thing to use. So the plan is to run three groups. We're going to go for the mild and moderates because we think they're more similar, not because we want to exclude the severes, but because it, it could complicate it a bit more. And we can look at those later. 40 patients, slightly more. Um, we're going to run it in Oxford, um, get samples from the UK Biobank because collecting samples would cost us hundreds of thousands of pounds, but we can get them from this fantastic Biobank that was set up in the UK. Um, we'll run them in Oxford. We'll provide the same samples to a group in Limerick and also Alan Moreau, who some of you may have heard about in Canada. We're all doing Raman. And then we're going to combine, compare the different approaches, different labs. So we, this time we run a training set of 30, five in the test set, and then we use five that have never been tested before. And, and people have people people have sort of criticized what we've done, but we're really limited with the numbers. So this is a bigger study. It's still not perfect, but it will be the next step moving forwards. So just in the last sort of 10 minutes, really, I want to finish off with um, this method. So as I said, you know, Warren Tate in New Zealand, other groups have found energy is a problem. Can we study energy more specifically? Can we look at the mitochondria? And on this top panel here, this is a preparation of mitochondria and the green dot is the laser on a single mitochondria. So we can really zoom in <clears throat> to a mitochondria and I'm gonna show you a bit of data where we've done this. So this is a, 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 these are cancer cells, which we work on. So we've got cancer cells that have very high mitochondrial activity. This one, H460, these ones are less. They don't really use their mitochondria in, in these cultures. And what we can do is we take lots of mitochondria and we put them in a, in a tube and we can measure their ability to use oxygen. So when things go up here, it means they're very good at using oxygen. So you can see clearly that this H460 uses lots of oxygen, this one doesn't, and then we can poison them and play with them and do things with them. So what we then did, so this is lots of mitochondria and we won't get lots of mitochondria and we want to look at what's going on in a single cell. Um, we, we took the mitochondria from this cell line here, um, which has very high on mitochondria and this is the profiles. So these are pure mitochondria, one mitochondria, and this is incredibly interesting. So look at the different peaks we get here. So what we can do here is we can actually make them work. So we can add succinate, which is like a food. So this mitochondria, these are all the same mitochondria, and we've made this one work. And this is what we get. And these blue peaks are well-known mitochondrial markers. So we know we've got mitochondria in our chip down the microscope. And then we add something called ADP, which makes ATP. So th these, these mitochondria are now making energy and you can see there's some real differences here. So this peak has, has got grown bigger. Um, this one shifted to the left and this one has shrunk. So this is what's happening when your mitochondria are making fuel energy that you can use in your cells. This is just with food. So this is really nice. And so you can see that. And then we can poison them. So we can say, right, we're going to mess them up big time. So we mess them up in two ways. And again, you can see real differences. So when we mess them up here, you go back to this type of profile, you lose that ATP peak uh, and the same here. So these are very similar. And we see the same here. You, you, you're you going back to what was there before. And this has shifted back. So this is really quite exciting. So we can look at mitochondria in isolation. And the next step is to do something like this. And so we take cells from a patient and then we say, right, we want to look at the mitochondria. So we come in with our laser and then we interrogate them and we get a readout and we should be able to tell what they're doing. And this is the next step. And we've started to do this in our cancer work. And the next step is to try and do that in MECFS. Now, the challenge with MECFS is the cells. Uh, and also, I just missed this out. So one of our biggest challenges is the microscope we use is 15 years old. And there's some really incredibly 
fancy new ones that cost quarter of a million pounds. And I just applied for one through the university. I'm hopeful we'll get it because we put quite a bit of money in from the department because this is the future of, of biological research. This should be a tool that we have in the labs. And at the moment, you only find it in engineering and material science labs and not in biological labs. It makes my life really difficult when I take human samples because I don't want them in their lab. So we're going to change that, hopefully. So what could we do with it? And so PBMCs or these blood cells, they don't really have very good mitochondria. So could we study cells that do have good mitochondria? And so we could take what's called a muscle biopsy from a patient so they could get a bit of muscle. And this is what we do for these mitochondrial disease patients. And you see this classical pattern. They have very red regions where the mitochondrial increase numbers because they're not working very well. Um, and so we can see that, but you don't see this in MECFS. There has been some studies back in the 1990s where there was some evidence, but it wasn't really clear enough. This paper came out recently um, from the NIH showing that there was, a, again, evidence of mitochondrial respiration problems in muscle. So this would be a good idea. But my challenge is, how do I get normal muscle um, ethically so to run in a study? And that's going to be difficult for me because we don't have any, if we don't have anything to compare it to, it's going to be quite difficult. However, there are other ways of doing this. And so we're really lucky in Oxford. I work with some great people that do MRI. So Beata is, works in psychiatry and Ladislav is in, in medicine and he works on muscle and they do <clears throat> MRI imaging and they're just getting to the end of a long COVID study where they screen the patients like I talked about earlier. Uh, not big numbers because it costs almost a thousand pounds per patient to put them through this, my, this MRI. This is a seven Tesla imaging. If you go for an MRI at the hospital, you'll probably have a three Tesla. So they'll look at structures so three tests that can look at structures in the brain you can see maybe a tumor in the brain or, or where things aren't right but this goes to another level and i'll come to that in a second they fill in questionnaires and we, and they look at the brain and the muscle but these are living we haven't got to take a chunk of muscle we can't take obviously some brain that wouldn't be ethical or, or be dangerous um but we could take some muscle but there's a much better way of doing it so the challenge of this is that you can't this is a on the on the on the background here, this is a normal MRI you get in a hospital. You go in for a scan, you get a 3T scan, but we need to go deeper than this. So in the in the white boxes here, what we've done is we've put them in the big imaging system, the seven Tesla magnet, and we can pick up metabolites. Like I showed you before, you can pick up glutamate, GABA, and we can see these. And we are seeing differences in the patients between the controls and the MECFS, but also the long COVID patients, they are similar, but there are some interesting differences between the long COVID patients and the MECFS. So this is a bit like the plasma metabolomics, and we need to combine the two together. But I think the muscle is really exciting. So what we can do in the magnet, so this is a, the, the, the patient's muscle in the magnet, we can go in and look at in detail. We can make them exercise, not on a bike, but we can make them you know, strain the muscle in the magnet. And so this is an example of a trace. So going back a bit, so ATP, is a really important energy fuel. I showed you with the mitochondria, but muscle uses something called creatine phosphate. This is the energy fuel that's used by a muscle. So this is a control and this is a patient. So this is a scan across the muscle and this is at rest here. And so just concentrate on the phosphocreatine peak, which is the key one. Um, it, it, it's high at rest. You put them on exercise and it drops down. And then when they recover, it goes back up again. Look at the patient, less at rest you know, it, it drops down and doesn't really recover, but it goes back to where it was. So there's a problem here with phosphocreatine in this individual. ATP, yes, there is a bit of a difference, but it's probably harder to see. And you can see this graphically here, but lots of things are changing. The ATP is pretty consistent in the muscle, so it probably wouldn't be a really good marker, but the phosphocreatine is quite different and the PI and the other factors. So this is really quite exciting. So we need to start to combine these clinical measures into our studies going forwards. So my last slide. So what are we going to do? We need to validate that Raman method. Could it be a test? You know, we need to prove that it works on a on another group. We need to bring in other diseases. We're trying to get some money to, to work on autism. Autism is very similar, particularly regressive autism. These kids have very similar mitochondrial problems in their plasma uh, that we see in MECFS. So that's a group to add in, along with the chronic Lyme, maybe the PANS. Um, can we see these persistent pathogens? They're not, there's not loads of them. Um, I went to a talk, they were talking about this Borrelia spirochete. You grow it in the lab, you might get one divided into one 
in 24 hours. If you had staphylococcus on a plate, you get 10,000 from one in 24 hours. So it's an order of magnitude. And this is the challenge, is to really prove that these things are there. Because if we can't prove they're there, the doctors aren't going to prescribe antibiotics. They're not going to do the workup on the patient. So we need to develop these methods, and that's the plan. And one of the big things for us is really, we, have, we do some great work in Oxford, in my lab, in, in the MRI, the clinical labs, and even physiology in Oxford Brooks. But we need to combine what we're doing into one sensor, not, not a physical sensor, but to work together. You know, you, But to do this, we need about two million pounds to run a big five year program. But that's what we need to find. So if anyone's watching this and has got two million pounds, then contact me. Um, and then push forwards in treatment trials. You know, we can, I think we're getting very close to be able to separate the patients out into groups. There may be one group when we do a baseline analysis of what they've got, we'll respond to a drug differently to another group. And we can identify that early on. So then when we run a big treatment trial, we can bring in the right patients and not throw something at people that's the wrong drug. You know, you don't treat breast cancer patients all the same if you've got, um, if you've got um, the different receptors, you do different treatments. And so that's, and in MS, it's stratified. So we stratify the medicine. We've got to do exactly the same with this condition. And just to finish off really, so these are the guys that do all the work. Uh, some great collaborations to chemistry and engineering as well, and people over here uh, on this slide and the funders. So the ME Association in, in the UK have kept us alive, basically. We've had, the biggest grant we've ever had was 100,000, where we did all the metabolomics. Um, actually, that Raman project cost ten thousand pounds because we had your bow. You know that that's and she was a student on another project. Um, Amiga is a local um, group that supports the patients, a bit like the ME group you have in Auckland. Gave us some funding early on, and we had a, a grant for for a PhD student with Inga. So little bits of money, but I think it's changing. I I sit on a government panel in the UK, and they they are waking up to the fact we have to do something in these illnesses. We can't just. I think. As bad as COVID was, it's woken up a few people in the medical profession and the government to think we need to do something. And just one last slide, just to give you, put this into context really. So we, 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 do, we do struggle with our funding. So we have a, a funding page on the University of Oxford website, and this is what it costs, you know. So to, to, to run a PhD student at, at a proper, you know, to pay their fees, to give them a good stipend to live on and to run, we're looking at about 3,300 per month. And at the moment, most of my PhD students come with no money. So I find the money to run the experiments. And then over the time, we manage to get some money in. But ideally, you want to have 100,000 pounds in a pot so I can, we get fantastic students apply to Oxford to do PhDs, but I can't recruit them because I don't have the budget. And then you get somebody like your bar where you could fly with a student. Postdocs, these are trained scientists, so they hit the ground running, so you get more out of them. A student, you probably take a year, year and a half training them. So you've only got a three-year program. So um, we tried several times to get, you know, small donations monthly. It can make a real difference to what we do. Anyway, I'll stop sharing there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry if I've gone on too long. I hope I've not bored everybody with that. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin. You certainly didn't bore me. Everybody hear me okay? I'm in a new location now, so hopefully things are working. Okay, good. You got, I can hear you fine, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Just really quickly, look, um, you know, seeing talented teams like yours work on this illness, I think, gives everybody hope. Thank you for the time and dedication. So hard to raise money in this environment. Um, you know, we, I think the whole community is grateful for, for amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, Just as importantly, it's really validating to hear that you, know, you look at biological signatures and it's showing up as something's really going wrong with me here and somewhere else, somewhere else. And same with long COVID. I mean, in a world where you're often told the illness might be in your head um, to have mm. you know, intelligent researchers like you be able to show that it definitely isn't. It's really validating. Um, team, a game plan for our last 10 minutes. I think we are going to 12.30 in our meeting. Um, let's get as much Q&A in as possible. Um, Dr. Morton, if you don't mind, might be some quite brief rapid fire. Yeah, answer. sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and anyone who wants to stay around for a formal part of a business uh, meeting, so I think we'll kick that off at 12.30. So anybody who was just there for Dr. Morton and wasn't so interested in voting, um, feel free to head off at 12.30, I think. So Q&A time. Michelle, do you want to kick us off? Oh, you're on mute, Michelle. 
sorry about that. Hey, um, Pip, would you like to go first? You've had your hand up for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes, I had a couple of questions. Uh, thank you mm -hmm. very much, Carl, Dr. Morton, for all this information. I was diagnosed with severe in the UK and went through uh, Dr. Mushal, who was linked in with Dr. Sarah Myhill, and mm -hmm. she did tests on mitochondria back in 2016, 17 through Acumen Labs. Mm -hmm. um, Acumen Labs did, uh, I think that's Dr. Sorry. Dr. John uh, McLaren Howard. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And and um, at that time, that was the first time I've had it for 35 years uh, that I had any sort of test to show levels of my mitochondria. And they also did dysbiosis. They did the whole realm. Mm -hmm of testing I just wondered how that's connected with what you're doing and for me now that I'm back in New Zealand um, that level of testing is not available here um, mm -hmm. and it's also that the 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 research that's been done in the UK that we're watching with bated breath none of the participants can be from New Zealand obviously because of the difficulty getting lab results to you a blood mm -hmm. tests to you how can we improve that and uh, allow us to be part of this testing um, and get information to help us to treat get the testing, different levels? Yeah. Because you know, a lot of what we do right now is focused on mild and moderate. I am now, mm. please God, I'm holding at mm -hmm. moderate. I was severe, um, yeah. but most of what we offer can and is only really focused at the mild and moderate just purely because of the difficulty getting to people who are severe mm. um, yeah so I just wondered how can we yeah how can we change that how can we find out what tests we can do here I know yeah there's a taste suppose, doing some, but... yeah, yeah it's more so there's different tests isn't there there's a test to, to prove that you have what you have and then there's tests like the myhill test that might tell you you've got a mitochondrial problem um, or our tests that might tell you that you've got a problem with a pathogen. I yes. suppose the question is, what do you do with the information? So I think if, if, we're, if our test is validated, then it will be rolled out everywhere. I would hope that other countries would, because you need to prove there's lots of tests that are out there that are not properly validated. So the myhill test wasn't properly validated. So they were never going to use, and also the Myhill test was quite, we tried to look at the Myhill test um, and we couldn't reproduce the Myhill test. There are reasons why that might be the case. Uh, ATP, I mentioned it briefly in my talk, is a really hard thing to measure. Mm. So I think the Myhill test was never going to be something that could easily be run in a routine lab. I met John McLaren, I went to his lab, he talked about the methods, um, but he was an expert in doing it and you're not going to get that level. So we need something uh, there is a mitochondrial problem in in this illness, but but maybe the myhill test isn't the test isn't the test that we need. But I think the imaging I showed you at the end, the sort of muscle imaging approach, yes. that's going to be the best test um, because at the moment a blood test, uh, bl blood cells don't really have very high mitochondrial function. So really, you you're in the noise. We work with skin cells; they're in the noise of the assay. Um, so being able to put, look at somebody's muscle in the magnet and prove that when they push a little box, they can't stimulate. So in the UK, seven Tesla imaging is, we've got one in Oxford, it's a research tool. Um, but if this proves successful, and say you could do test people like that in, you're not just talking about ME, you're talking about long COVID, maybe fibromyalgia, um, other conditions. It could be, you know, there, there will be, there, you could buy one of these instruments for a, for a big hospital in the city. They're not ridiculous money. So I think that's where we need to go. We need to prove that our tests, blood tests works. If we can, it could be rolled out in other places. The problem at the moment is the microscope is quarter of a million pounds. There are, do you remember the, the COVID? You have the lateral flow tests that you do for COVID. You put the blood on and you put the nasal swab on. Something like that could maybe work with Raman because we don't need to see a cell. We just need to see the cells streaming past um, the laser. And so the, I'm talking to somebody that in Oxford that could maybe help us develop a better way, a clinical test, because the microscope, 
probably, and also it's quite tedious, a better way of doing it. So we're at the first stage of that. But I really believe that the, the imaging, the MRI is, and maybe the, the, the factors in the blood, I really believe that there could be bacteria in patients with MECFS, that if yes. we knew what they were, and we could then take your blood in the lab and test back antibiotics on it and pick the right ones, because soft cell did that. So soft cell took people that had chronic urinary tract infections. They grew the they grew the the L forms from the blood, not the urine, and they found that the back the antibiotics that worked on the blood L forms were really quite effective in the patients. Again, they haven't run done a proper study. Um, but it's interesting but, to me that you have the, those factors that change also when you have ME for a very long, you know, as you get mm. older, it changes again. So, you know, all, most of us who've had long-term mm. ME have had reactivation of EBV or yeah. CMS or whatever it's called yeah. again and again. Yeah, and this right. yeah, but, um, We just have a few other people who need to... Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry these questions and answers can go on for an hour and a half sometimes. It's very useful. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, carry on. So next question, Michelle. Awesome. Um, I'm just asking. Oh, I know I'm not muted. Um, I'm just asking for um some questions that are in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Case Jarkas has asked, what are the antibiotics that can reach the mitochondria or act intracellularly? Okay. Um. So the so the ones that work on the L form bacteria are things that hit bacteria without walls. So things like doxycycline is quite good. Penicillin doesn't um, doesn't work on those L forms. So doxycycline is a good one. Um, if I was you, I'd look at the Lyme literature. So the chronic Lyme disease literature. There's a couple of papers come out of Jack Lambert's group in Dublin. They use four antibiotics a panel. They're quite effective in chronic Lyme patients, even though those patients weren't diagnosed with Lyme with the proper test. I, there was a great talk at this meeting in in boston from a canadian hospital where they took 500 people um only 10 percent had a, a positive test people were bitten by a tick 20 years ago they gave them and they all improved it was quite remarkable so but it's the problem of, of proving the diagnosis with the medical profession is going to be the challenge um which antibiotics it probably depends a lot about what you have in your system and also these bacteria are going to be hidden away. They might be in joints. They might be in the brain. There's some interesting work about biofilms. So there's something called methylene blue that is quite a safe compound. People are taking, doctors are prescribing for biofilms. But, you know, I need to show that you have pathogens. And that's going to be the key goal going forwards. Um, but we might not be right working in the right tissue. You know, you, 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 you the blood cells aren't that bad. And I think the mitochondrial effect in blood is probably a response to a systemic issue that the whole body's in trauma and, and the blood is part of that process. But what is causing the trauma is the is the key thing. I saw some great talks about um, looking at skin biopsies. Um, yeah. One more question, is that okay? One more question, yeah. I've actually got two from the chat as well. Should we uh, fire off those two? Um, Dr. Morton, if we didn't have time to get all the questions out today, is there a mechanism where we can send a couple your way? Or are you a bit too busy? I can, uh, <laughs> I, can I can try not. I can try not. I'll tell you what, why, why don't we, I, I'd rather do a Q&A another time. So if somebody wants to have a ask more questions, it'd be quicker for me to do a half an hour call on Teams with the people than spend lots of time. I'd rather do that way. Because, that'd have been uh, a great support group yeah, so, so do that so if, if people want to con just send me an email and i'll arrange maybe in a week's time to set up a call that's i, I, I won't do it half past nine at night for you i'll try and pick a time <laughs> but it's not easy is it so i'll have to be sort of yeah, no, my, my seven o'clock or something that'll be your nine o'clock nine o'clock in the morning very kind of um, i was told fiona said she has a really quick one and i'm not sure if the yeah. other question is quick michelle maybe if we overrun two or three minutes to get those ones and Anyone else who has questions, maybe put them in the chat and that goes up. Uh, Watson's kind of offer for his half an hour call. Yeah, so um, do you want to kick off Fiona's question or was the other one quick as well? Okay. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, you go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, just talking about the antibiotics, um, I've got absolutely all the symptoms that you've talked about in all your slides, and a very big part of what I've been working on for like 20 plus years is the gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. So I actively avoid antibiotics unless I'm about to keel over, probably dead, so mm -hmm. <laughs> because it upsets the gut microbiome microbiome so would these antibiotics should you we get to that stage would they, they be able to be introduced directly to the blood system injected to the muscles etc to avoid creating problems in the gut sort of you know um yeah, solving there, one there thing are, and creating another problem well that's right there, there are some that um can be injected but they're quite nasty ones they're quite heavy duty ones what tends to happen when there's a really good herbalist in edinburgh that so a lot of patients, the Lyme patients, will have antibiotics, and then, they, as you say, it does mess up the gut. But then they try and put it back together again. Um, so it is a problem in terms of restoring it. But it depends what's the driver. What is the cause? Is your gut caused by your infection that you can't really diagnose, or is the gut causing the problem? I, I work a bit with this private clinic that did fecal transplants, and they did see some transformative things with some patients, but it wasn't properly tested. Uh, and they were adding things like butyrate, which is, a, as I said, was lacking in the patients. They gave uh, something called biomuno, which is a sort of oligosaccharide that the bugs like. So, so the dysbiosis, we, we're trying to get this paper together where we're showing that the ME patients' bacteria seem to be slightly different from the other dysbiotic ones. And so trying to correct that might be really helpful. But I don't think you're going to get the, the goodies from taking oral probiotics because a lot of them don't make it through so and people are there's a couple there's a company in australia that are trying to de 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 develop oral coatings that get get through the stomach into the lower bowel which is where you need them um but fiona so i'm sorry so in terms of you could get somebody to give you intravenous but you'd need to really prove that you had a problem to do that i don't think anyone would do that and, and then yeah. you can prove it yeah, for instance, some of the things you've been talking about, I've had tests mm. that prove my butyrate slow, and there's actually been tests that have proved that some of the good bacteria I'm meant to have completely mm. die off. So it's not about um, right, feeding okay. them; they're completely yeah. dead. And every few years, I have a I take a course of what they call Mutaflor, which I think comes from is a good E. coli from Germany. Mm. And I take yeah, yeah. that every few years and then try and feed it, but it eventually dies. And then I take it again. And it's very, very expensive because it's refrigerated okay. all the way from Germany. So, I mean, this sort of thing, when you're trying to rebuild your gut over 20 odd years, mm. the last thing you want to do is take an antibiotic and start. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely appreciate that. But then somebody anyway, needs to study these. Someone needs to study these compounds properly, don't they? They need to get these drugs and test them out. And then who do you test them on? Because um, we're finding that people with... People with chronic fatigue without irritable bowel syndrome have quite different microbiomes, which is quite surprising. Uh, but then cancer patients have really dysbiotic. And then there was a study in Belgium where they looked at people, healthy people over a month, and they went all up and down. They were in the dysbiosis phase and good, and they were well. So it's, it's really knowing what's normal, what's the normal range. And you're only going to get that from sort of longitudinal studies. There, there are a couple of herbs. There was one paper I can send you, Fiona. Drop me an email. There was a paper on a Chinese herb that they used in a mouse model um, with something similar to what I talked about, about this lipopolysaccharide. They gave neomycin, which destroys the whole gut microbiome. And they, those mice did really well. And then they did something with a Chinese herb. And it didn't destroy the gut microbiome, but it rebuilt itself. And so I think there's stuff in Chinese medicine. And we're actually applying to the EU to run a big herb study in a part of a Horizon grant. So no, we don't want to do antibiotics. And herbs have a history of being beneficial. And there are herbs that can rebuild your gut, herbs, herbs that are good for the immune system, herbs that are good for energy. So I think that might be... But it needs to be done in a this is going to be a thousand patient study if we get the money so it could be really useful to do that can i just um talking. pop in pop in there um how about i email you um dr morton because otherwise you might be getting 100 emails okay. <laughs> and and, and yeah, i'll you sort, share you sort them out that'd be good yeah and then i'll share um your answer um with everybody okay. else um through our forums um so donna lamont um had a question and and please excuse my pronunciation I had a positive test result to Boreella burgdorferi. 
but got yeah. told it was a false positive because I had antibodies <laughs> to Epstein, Epstein Barr virus. I'm wondering how right. I can find out if I do have Lyme disease or not. Mm. Joe, I, I had a, I mentioned yeah. a phage test on my slide. Well, it might just have to be one or two. There we go. Yeah. So a quick answer. There's there's a company in Belgium called Red Labs, and they run this phage test for Borrelia. It's about 200 and 300 pounds. Again, it's not been validated, but I saw some remarkable data from them. And I would, if it was me, and I needed to prove to the doctor that, hey, that wasn't a false positive, I think they could give you good evidence that it was a real result. Because otherwise they won't treat you, will they? So. But yeah, thank you so much for attending and being part of our community. Really great.